Okay, so I'm Connie Bossert, and I'm here to talk about app quality. And we're, we're doing like a complete 360 from the whole discussion we just had, because there's a lot of discussion about monetization and business strategies and what the future is going to bring and what our market has. Um, and sometimes those things are really at odds with producing quality apps. And so what I want you to do is kind of set that other stuff aside for a little while, and we're going to have a discussion just about app quality. So first, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Connie Bossert. I graduated from Florida State University with a degree in psychology. Then I got a doctoral degree in educational psychology from Penn State University. Um, after that, I worked as an instructional designer and a college professor. I taught pre-service teachers. And then um, now I'm a parent of two kids. I also volunteer regularly at my children's school, so I have lots of contact with children. Um, I'm really passionate about the teaching and learning process, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Fair Lady Media. Um, Fair Lady Media was founded in 2008, and we have two full-time employees, my husband and myself. Um, we've developed over 40 apps over the last eight or nine years. Um, currently, most of our apps are on iOS. Um, we did port two apps to Android early on, but they, they didn't have a lot of success there, so um, those are the only two that ended up going to Android. Um, we also produce apps that are English only. We do localize the app store descriptions, and then um, within the apps, our apps are very simple to navigate, so um, we find that we actually have a pretty good market internationally just because the apps are so easy to navigate without children requiring instructions. Um, we currently have 13 apps on the App Store um, in three bundles. And we're best known for our grandma and grandpa collection of apps. And um, we have a development cycle that is very um, rigorous. We have to produce four apps per year, um, one app every three months, which is a lot to do, but that's the way our business model pretty much has to work in order for us to be financially successful. So that's sort of the parameter in which we are working. Um, so if you ask the internet, what makes a quality app? These are the kinds of things that will come up. It has a straightforward user interface. It has fluid navigation. Um, it keeps it simple. It's polished. It knows its audience, okay? And to me, these metrics are okay for utility apps. You know, that would be great for a mortgage calculator. Um, but in this room, we're creating apps to do so much more than that. When we create apps for kids, we have a greater responsibility to provide a, a rich and meaningful experience. And um, adults find their own meaningful experiences, but a lot of times kids are sort of fed whatever we give them. And so I believe that we have a responsibility to give them something that is good um, and better than good. Um, so we need to create apps that excite, that entertain, that educate. We need a quality metric that extends beyond functionality. And most of the metrics that are out there, if you just search on, online, you're going to find metrics that really talk about functionality. Does the app actually work? And to me, that's sort of minimally passing, barely competent. You know, that's, that's like the low bar. I want to see apps that do so much more than that. And I think a good example is if you were to go see a Broadway show, you wouldn't come out of the show if someone said, hey, how was the show? You wouldn't say, hmm, did the actors speak loudly enough? And were the singers in tune? And was the lighting adequate? And were, were the sets well painted? Those wouldn't be the things you would look at. You would instead ask yourself, was I moved? Will I remember this experience forever? And I think those are the kinds of metrics we need to be using when we're looking at apps. So let's take a look at this group's lens for quality. And you're going to need your laser pointers for this portion. So go ahead and dig those out. And while you're finding your laser pointers, I want you to take a moment and picture in your mind a child that you care about. This could be your son, your daughter, a child that you know, um, a niece, a nephew, a family member, a neighbor. Um, and what I'm going to do is on the next, on each of the next five slides, I'm going to show you two similar pictures side by side. And the pictures represent something that will be presented to this child that you care about. 
okay? Mm -hmm. And so on each slide, your job is to choose which item you would give this child because it has a higher quality, okay? So you're all ready with your um, laser pointers. And I know this, the pictures are very similar, but you're gonna have to use a discerning eye and figure out which one you think has the greater quality. So first, we're going to give your child a snack. <laughs> okay, looks like we have a pretty, strong, pretty strong trend to that right side. I don't want any jokers. I want you to really seriously consider about this, okay? So if this was your child, which snack are you going to provide? Okay, so strong tendency towards the, the fresh fruit. Okay, next we're going to give your child some exercise. Okay, now next we're going to give your child a bunny to hold. Oh, good lord. <laughs> That's not fair. Okay. I, know, I know the pictures are so similar, but you know, use your discerning you eye. Okay. You can't put bunnies in the presentation. I know. Well, That's I have bunnies, shot. so you know they got to be in the presentation. Okay, next, your child is going to do a little bit of cooking. And then finally, we're going to give your child a story. And again, the pictures are very similar, but okay. So you'll notice there's a high degree of agreement, okay? And so many people think that quality is so difficult to define. But I would argue that actually we know what quality when we see it. We do. We can see two very similar things and look at the two of them and say, I know which one has a high degree of quality. And that there's actually quite a bit of agreement as far as what that quality is. Now, I did a presentation in November at the Duster Magic in New Jersey, and one of the things I said during that presentation is the best way to teach children is to enrich their lives. And what I mean by this is that we need to provide kids with opportunities for meaningful experiences. These are worthwhile experiences that they will cherish and remember for a long time. And I would argue that we know what those experiences look like when we see them. Now, why are experiences important? Well, the first reason is that we learn through our experiences. And this, I'm gonna put my educational psychology hat on for just a moment. Um, there's this thing called experiential learning theory. And back in the 1970s, a guy named David Kolb helped to develop what is called the modern theory of experiential learning. And he drew heavily on the work of John Dewey, Kurt Lewin, uh, Jean Piaget, and put together this theory of experiential learning in which he said that the best, a really good way to teach learners is to have them experience something and then reflect upon it and then they can use that reflection to apply what they have learned to future situations. And since that time in the 1970s, there's been loads of research on experiential learning, and that's where you get people talking about active learning, hands-on learning, all these other learning theories. A lot of them have been based on that idea that you take an experience, you have the child do an experience, or the learner do an experience, you have them reflect on it, and then it gives them an opportunity to fully absorb it and apply that information. The second reason that experiences are important is that experiences actually make us happy. And um, back in the 1970s, there was this other research that was also going on, and it was, can money buy you happiness? Okay? And Unfortunately, they found that even though there were very there were rising incomes in the United States at the time, that actually um, Americans were not becoming happier. Um, that actually, once your basic needs are met, um, that you don't get any happier. Um, but there's been research recently that has shown that, um, in fact, if you spend your money on experiences rather than on things people do report a higher degree of happiness. They do express themselves, themselves in a way that shows a higher level of happiness. So if you take this example in your head, 
let's just say tomorrow you went out and you got yourself a brand new $20,000 car. And you go and you drive that car around and for the next five years you're enjoying that car, you're living in that car, but over the course of five years that car is going to become a way of getting from point A to point B. Even though it was really exciting when you first bought it, later it becomes just a way to get from your house to your work. Okay? And you've used that $20,000 to buy this car, but because of human adaptation, we adapt to having that car in our lives, and it's no longer a, an amazing thing to have anymore. However, if you took that same $20,000 and you did, over that five years, 20 different $1,000 experiences, okay? You went ballooning with your family. You went on a helicopter ride over the Grand Canyon. You went on a trip to Disney World. You hosted a family reunion at your house. You did all these things, 20 different $1,000 things. At the end of that five years, do you think you might be happier? The answer is the research is showing that yes, you would. You'd be happier because you'd be talking about these experiences. You'd be reliving them. You would be remembering them. But how would you get to them? <laughs> <laughs> I, I shouldn't leave these dramatic pauses in my talk. <laughs> it opens up opportunities for the pot shots and the I had to get, for, had to get for dairy guys. So. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so um, the author B.J. Neblett described our very selves as the sum total of our experiences. And he went on to say, we're the sum total of our experiences. Those experiences, be they positive or negative, make us the person we are at any given point in our lives. And like a flowing river, those same experiences and those yet to come continue to influence and reshape the person we are and the person we become. None of us are the same as we were yesterday, nor will be tomorrow. A great example of this, uh, yesterday when Warren was doing his um, book app demo, and Barbara Chase at one point, she cried out, I don't want to have my experience interrupted. I want to immerse myself in it. She wanted to have that experience. She didn't want it to just be interrupted and have it pass by. Okay, so if we look back at that last slide that you guys were comparing, um, I'm sure that none of you compare these two books based on whether they had age-appropriate text and vocabulary, whether or not the book has a good sturdy binding, whether or not, woo, thing just went to sleep, um, whether or not they, um, why is this so um, whether or not the, the font was easily readable, how many pages it has, how much it might cost, whether the illustrations on the front capture the essence of the story. No, instead, you judge the book based on the experience you believed that it would provide. And I believe you can take that same lens and apply it to apps as you are evaluating the quality of an app. You can evaluate the quality of an app based on the experience that it provides. Connie Bosser, 2017. <laughs> okay, so, and Jason Crow this morning said, um, I see the beginning of each of our apps as an entrance to a playground. Mm. I loved that. Because to me, that's like it's like an open door into an experience. And there are many very successful apps on the App Store that, that use this kind of approach. They say, what would it be like, for instance, um, to play piano like a pro? Or what would it be like to be born with wings that were too small? Or what would it be like to own and operate a big farm? Or what would it be like to walk through an M.C. Escher drawing. And we have apps for all of those things on the App Store. And those, those apps provide an experience for, um, for, for the user. Now, in our space, I got to thinking, oh, hey, we should be creating worthwhile experiences in our apps, right? It seems like, dang, you know, that's like your little aha moment. Well, the problem is that, um, we thought, hmm, um, we have to do that in each one of our apps, okay, um, in under three months, okay, and um, that's so we can pay our mortgage. So it's a high stakes situation, okay. So this is me going through that process, and um, I finally reached the conclusion that it may just be impossible um, to do all this. Um, but after a lot of thought and after time doing this over the last few years, 
um, I've realized that there are ways that you can experientize your app. And there are ways that you can do this um, relatively efficiently so that you can build it right into your development process and that you can actually still stick to your three-month development cycle if that's what you're working with. Or you can do it with very limited time and resources. So I made up a new word, experientize. I got it 2017. I define it as, and it's a verb, uh, to create and modify digital content to better emulate meaningful real world experiences. My example sentence the developer will experientize her new game to make it more memorable to players. And I even threw in a her in there just, you know, for gender you know, and stuff. <laughs> um, so these are my. Uh, eight ways that we at Fairly the Media um, work to experientize our apps. These may or may not, some of them may or may not apply to you. Um, they come with, with various um, challenges all their own. But I'm going to go through these eight um, and you can see what you think. You're trying to get in the cookbook, aren't you? <laughs> These are great ingredients, and you're going to have a chef hat stuck photoshopped nice. on your head nice. before Just you make sure, know. Make sure it covers You'll my curls. You'll see. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so first, one way is to begin with an experience. Start with that. Um, and uh, many of our apps, like uh, Camping with Grandpa is the perfect example. We started with, we had come back from a camping trip, and I said to the kids, what did you like about the camping trip? And we were on the way back in the car, and they're like, oh! Oh, we roasted marshmallows and we went on that hike and remember we saw those animal tracks on the trail and we did this and that and they started listing all these things and they were so excited and I thought wow I wish I could just capture that experience and put it into an app <laughs> you know and so we developed camping with grandpa it was very well received and so I think that that's one way that you can begin it's not the only way. You can also go back after the fact, I think, and take an idea that you have and add more experiences into it. So it can be big or small. It can be a slice of life. It can be outside the box. You know, if you want to do Pinky the Unicorn Discovers a New Friend, something like that. It doesn't have to necessarily be a life experience. It doesn't have to be real. But it needs to, to, to feel real. Um, and then another thing I wanted to mention was key details. Sometimes you, um, you don't capture the whole experience. We didn't capture the whole experience of, of camping in our Camping with Grandpa app. We, did, we couldn't actually have the child sleep in a tent. But we could emulate roasting a marshmallow. So sometimes you have to just keep, get those key details of what that experience, what captures that, that key experience. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is because we're on this limited resources um, situation, that um, I put a limited resources tip at the bottom of each one of these slides. In this case, it is choose an experience that is easily t translated to a touch screen. Okay, so swimming might not be you know, the easiest thing to translate, for example. And for each of these, I also have an example. Um, this is Word Runners by Touch Press, and it's a really different kind of story app. Um, in this one, I feel like it's almost like the developer said, what would it be like to jump in and be the character in a story as you're reading it? And then you could experience it as you go by interacting with the words of the story. And I just thought that was a really creative idea. Um, so I'm going to play a little example of this. Um, okay, so she gets to some ruins, and she has to try and jump over them. So she draws energy from the word jump. But unfortunately, that's not quite enough. So then you have to look back and look at the other words in the story. And I find the word persistent. And then I come back. And now I'm going to draw energy from jump again. And now she's going to be persistent with her jumping. way of creating an experience in what would otherwise be just a storybook okay 
So the, the second way to experimentize your app is to make it snap, snap, crackle, and pop, and bang. Um, back in the 1920s, I think it was 1927, um, the Kellogg's company came up with this new cereal, and it snapped, it crackled, it popped, and it was an instant success and sensation, and over the next, um, what has it been, 90 years, um, the Kellogg's company has, has jumped on that and, and marketed it, and it has become, you know, everybody knows that this is the cereal that talks to you in the morning. Um, and I think that that's, it's so important to have your app um, make, make every kind of sound that it can. And if you think about it in terms of an experience, okay, when you're in this room, there are all kinds of noises happening all the time. I can hear people typing. I can hear people whispering in the back. I can hear someone walking across the room. I can, I can hear my own, you know, my own voice talking. And we never have complete silence um, when, we're, when we're in our world. So um, when you create an app, you want to create it in a way that emulates those experiences. Okay, so background music and sound effects. You guys, a lot of you guys know this. Um, sound effects for all your player actions, sound effects for your animations and your motion, voiceovers, multiple versions of voiceovers. That's one of my pet peeves is when somebody says something again and again. Great job, great job, great job. So I love seeing more variety than that. Um, and then the limited resources tip in this one is to consider an unlimited sound effects subscription as opposed to having custom sound effects made every time you make a new app. Um, that's just been one of our tips for um, because we have limited resources. This um, example is Animal Fun Park. It's by Philomendus. And this one is kind of fun because it very much puts you in the experience of being in a fun park. Um, and I like the way they use, they use tons of sound throughout the app, and it really helps you immerse in the experience. There's a sound effect for every single part of the experience. Now, in this case, the experience happens to be a fun part, which is supposed to be noisy, right? It's supposed to have lots and lots of stuff going on. My only criticism of that one is, I wish the drafts all had different voices and didn't say the same thing again. But um, other than that, the whole app just really has a lot of good use of sound effects. And then the next, um, next way to experientize your app is to play with perspective. Most people, I think, think about like side view, maybe top down, and that's it. But if you think about the real world, when I'm here, I can look up, I can look down and see my top down view, I can see side. When I walk, I get like this forward view of everything going by me. You, when I walk outside, I see parallax. I sometimes look down and see three-dimensional stuff, so I see isometric. I see scrolling backgrounds whenever I turn my head. So those are things that are all part of our real world experiences. And for this next example, I'm going to actually show one of our apps, not because it's a fantastic representation necessarily, but because I wanted to show why we switched perspective. We're going along with side view. This is our app, <coughs> Grandpa. We're going along in side view, and then suddenly we switch to top down. And there's three benefits of doing top down for this particular scene. One is the player can feel like they're driving the trucks. Um, second, we could add in humor by having the trucks crash into each other. If you just did a top um, side view matching game where you're, you're and the, the goal of the game is to match the truck to the written word name of the truck. Um, and if you were just doing a simple matching game, they, you wouldn't feel like you're driving the truck. They wouldn't be able to crash into each other. And then additionally, the player has an additional uh, visual spatial challenge of identifying the truck from above, which is really different from identifying it from the side. And so here it is, build a cramp up. You're so smart. 
All right, so then the next way to experientize your, your um, app is to make them laugh. Surprise, silly, do the impossible, failure is funny. All those things are great ways. Um, play on words, if you're doing any kind of language, you can use play on words. Um, all those are great ways to, um, to make them laugh. Our limited resources tip on this one is um, sometimes these are actually easier to add at the end of development. I, there was a question earlier this weekend and someone said, um, I think it was maybe during, um, I don't remember, uh, one of the presentations where someone said, when do you do that? And it was at the beginning. And I feel like this is one that you can sprinkle in at the end because you know your app really well by then. And so um, sometimes you can just add it in the funnies at the end of the app. And it's, it's, and it's actually, it makes the end part of your app development a little more interesting than it would normally be at the end of the process. Okay, now I had to put in Toka Hair Salon. This is the one app that made me laugh out loud when I first saw it. Um, now they have three apps, Toka Hair Salon 1, 2, and 3. This one happens to be um, Toka Hair Salon 2. But I just, every time I see this, it's just funny. Um, um, the stuff that you can do and like uh -huh. achieving the impossible and having her hair grow as long as you absolutely want it to grow and having her watch it, you know, as, as you're doing it. Um, I just think it's just beautiful in terms oh. of humor. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I'm giving her curls and I'm going to give her some color. And the way she holds her breath, I just love it. I mean, you can't help but smile when you're going through this process. And then this. This is what made me laugh out loud. The first time I touched the hair dryer and I saw one of these characters go blue, blue, blue like that with their cheeks. It's just, it's just wonderful. I, I love the humor in it. Um, and then another way is give them control. Choices and control over the experience or the story, a character, the environment. Um, have them take creative liberty. Have them draw something, create something, make something. Um, touch can equal instant action, and that gives the child complete control over the experience. Um, a perfect example is Minecraft. My kids are so hooked on Minecraft. And if I were to just go to them and say, hey kids, tell me four things you love about Minecraft. You'd be like, well, I can do this, and I can do that, and I can do this. They feel like they are their character. They are controlling their world. And that, I think, is what is so powerful about Minecraft. Our limited resources tip on this one is make sure your choices are worth the extra development time. So you can have an app that has, you know, 20 colors on it. Um, or you can have a, an app that has 80 colors, a coloring app that has 80 colors in it. Is it worth the extra development time to add the 80 colors? Um, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. My example in this one is Think Rolls Kings and Queens by um, Avocado. And they've had some great Think Rolls apps. This is their newest one. Um, and I think the Think Rolls games in general do a great job with giving the player control over both the environment and the character. And I think that that's really special. You don't see that very often. Um, their recent Kings and Queens app also kind of kicks it up a no notch in terms of their graphics, their sound effects. They've got really original puzzle design. So here's the Think Rolls one. Now I'm touching, I'm changing the environment. But now I can control the character too. And I think that's really special. <laughs> problem-solving app. And here I am, I'm touting all my competitors. So. <laughs> but that's what you have to do when you're looking at quality, you have to look at your competitors, see what they're doing. 
And I think that this is just a wonderful um, example of control. Um, and then the sixth way to experientize your app is to perform on your stage. Someone had, when we were doing the activity earlier in the weekend where we had to, we all drew a card and we all put ourselves in groups, and the question on my card had been, um, what did you want to be when you grew up? And I had said, I wanted to be something on a stage, like an actor or a singer or something like that. And, and then it occurred to me that my, um, my iPad is my stage. And I think if you think of your, of your iPad as being the stage that you're going to perform on and you think about the experience that you're going to provide the people who are interacting with that iPad, um, I think that that's a really powerful way of looking at it, that you can provide an amazing experience there. Um, and you're going to do this by making every scene screenshot worthy. That's like my little mantra. When I'm doing development, I will look at a particular scene and I'll say, is this screenshot worthy? And if not, I need to fix it. Because I don't want it, you know, if I were to take a screenshot now, could I put this on the App Store and be, have it be representative of this app? And if not, it needs some work still. Um, and then also just consistency of style with your graphics and illustrations, your use of color, your balance, focal points, visual effects, um, and engaging characters. Sometimes you see like these little characters with dead eyes. I don't know if you've seen that. There's like thousands of them on the App Store. Um, but they're either not looking at you or they just they just have this blank look. And I think that those engaging characters, you would never appreciate an actor on a stage who just came out there with you know dead eyes. You know, you you look at those facial expressions as part of the experience that you that you expect when you're seeing a performance on a stage. Our limited resources tip on this one is um, to spend extra time on features that you could use in future apps. Um, so if you're going to do this really amazing particle effect, it's better to spend the time on that if you think you can use it in a future app. And the example here is Dr. Panda Cafe. Tom did not pay me to do this. Um, I had this in my, in my presentation well before, um, before we even met. But I think that this is a beautiful combination of graphics, sound effects, consistency of style, and engaging characters. So here is my clip from Cafe. So think about the sound effects, the music, graphics, the engaging character. experientize your app is to use creative touches and so many people think that on the on the iPad or iPhone or whatever um, any kind of tablet that you can just touch drag and swipe but when you think of it as an experience there's like so many other ways that you can interact with that touch screen and when you watch a child um, interacting with a touch screen they don't say I'm swiping right now they say I'm cutting carrots now I'm washing the dish, and now I'm, you know, I'm turning the page. They see it as an action that is an experience. And I think that that way, if we incorporate that into our thinking as we are designing, that those touch experiences will come through as real experiences to the child. You start to see greater possibilities within the basic touch, drag, swipe mechanics. So some of the examples I've got, like select, cut away, where you take away a chunk of something. You can make something appear. You can hold something down. You can cause something to repel away from your finger. You can have something draw in, suck towards your finger. Um, with dragging, you can move. You can have something follow your finger. You can scroll with a tab. You can stretch a line. You can go through, touch to go, um, drag to go through a maze. With swipe, you've got flick and throw. You've got cut, you've got rub. You've got a horizontal spinner just like this, you got a vertical spinner, like this, and then you have a circular spinner, like this, okay? You can also draw, like free drawing, you can do restricted drawing with a mask where you hide some of the screen and you color, we call it magic coloring when we do that. 
You can follow a line, you can erase. Um, you can do multi-finger touches, drags, swipes, and draws. You can do force touch. For this next example, I had to kind of use some of our apps. I created a montage because I didn't want to just show one of these. So this is a little montage of a bunch of these creative touches in our apps. Watch me! Hmm? Yeah. This is just a basic drag and drop with music. Can you douse the fire? This is a drag and hold. you got to hang on to it. You don't want to drop the picture. Drag with a follow. It's following the finger. Ready to go. Touch to cut away. Mmm, good. Vertical spinner. Oh, 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 watch me dance. And then here's a circular spinner. Perfect fit. You are almost in. Reeling in. You bit. did it. That's a nice catfish. Multi-touch. When you touch multiple colors, it changes oh, the color. Makes the ah oh, sound. This is a bit of cutaway of that. Multi-touch with a drag. You have to put both guinea pigs in place for healthy. Color with a mask. So I can't color outside of the edges on this. And then you change the background, and this is still color with a mask, but it, it feels totally different. And then here's push. And here's a repel that's more of a blow, so you're revealing. Wow! Is that a triceratops? Where's an A here's a on this grave? Oh, you figured it out! And then horizontal You're almost there. Wow, what a sight! Force touch does a drum roll. And then dragging to follow a line, have a character follow a line. Free drawing, of course. Yellow. Tracks. But you can do free drawing that isn't a line, like this one you're drawing, but it's making animal tracks in the camping game. And then stretching a line. Alright, so those are some examples of creative touches. And then finally, keep it real. The real world is amazing, especially to kids. Um, and even fictional places have real world issues. So you can do things that are that feel real to the person, um, to the player. Um, kids learn best when they learn within a context. That's why, that's why everyone doesn't like math sheets. Math sheets are not in a context. Um, one thing that you can do to, with regard to quality is to use language. I know that people really shy away from using language because you can't globalize as easily. But we're not talking about globalizing in this talk. We're talking about quality. So um, language is part of our everyday world. This is something, when we're in this room, if we all came in here and we didn't use any language this entire weekend, what kind of experience would this have been for us? It would have been very lacking, right? So language is a really important part of our experiences. Make it relevant to kids' lives. For example, make your topics that, that feel relevant to them. School, education, play, family, pets, outings, toys, pretend. Those are the things that kids think about and, and care about. Um, and then use a kid's eye perspective. And I think Jason just, just talked about this wonderfully, using looking at it through the child's perspective. And then finally, don't do advertising and don't do gimmicks when we're talking about quality, okay? If you interrupt an experience in order to do advertising or in-app purchase or whatever it's going to be, when you're interrupting that, that experience, it does diminish the quality of the experience. And I know that we have to do those things, but I think it's better to keep those things outside of the play experience. Don't put your child into a dollhouse, and then they're playing and playing and playing, and then they touch a door in the dollhouse, and it's locked. 
you have to go to the app store. That to me is is a is a gimmicky kind of way of sneaking into that experience. Um, and I don't think I don't think any of us would like that. We used that I used that movie theater example yesterday when I said if you were sitting in a movie, you wouldn't want them to suddenly turn off the lights and come back in and try to get you to buy more food from the snack bar or something. The the experience is when you're in that experience, you don't want to be interrupted with gimmicks. And then finally, another way is to use narrative that kind of goes along with the language thing. But life is a story, and so we can tell stories through our apps too, even if it's on a very small scale, to, to think about the narrative um, of these experiences. Our limited resources tip on this one is to consider restricting your audience and or your platform in order to preserve quality, especially as early app developers. Right now, we don't have apps, a whole bunch of apps on Android. We don't globalize our apps, and I know that that's, we're missing a business opportunity there, but we can't do everything. We can't stretch ourselves and be everything to everyone and be the perfect business and be able to develop you know, wonderful quality apps in three months at a time. So something has to give. And in our case, that was, that was the thing that we chose. And then for keeping it real, my example comes from Tiny Bop. They do a fantastic job of keeping things real. So I'm just gonna play this real quick. This is their Mammals app. And I feel like you could just say, what would it be like to look at the inside of an elephant while it's moving and while it's eating and while it's doing its elephanty things? Um, I think it's just wonderful. It, it provides an experience. <laughs> and when you touch the different nerves, it sends the signals to the brain. And then on the last scene, I'm going through sort of the different systems, the body systems. I took out the elephant's bones, so I'm sort of taking them out one by one and taking the bones out. And eventually, <coughs> he's not going to be able to stand anymore. Um, but you know, it's that, what would happen if? What if I could? And it's creating an experience. Now, those are eight ways to experientize your apps. There are unfortunately trade-offs. Even though our company's focus is on quality, I recognize that quality is not the only thing that matters. It's difficult to get the right balance of competing priorities in your company. Um, focusing on quality can um, increase your development time. It can increase your development costs. I mean, a fully immersed 3D world is gonna be a long time and a lot of development to do. It may not appeal to an international audience. You have language and cultural references, humor, things like that. It may not translate easily to other platforms. Um, you may use time and resources that could be spent on other aspects of your business, such as marketing and ROI. And then you may have missed revenue opportunities because you're not looking at other revenue models, such as ads or subscriptions or things like that. So there are trade-offs when you focus on the culture. But Connie, I just want to interrupt for a second. Scott is, oh. has to take off. Yeah. No. Sorry, Connie. I was trying to quietly. No, it's okay. We can get away. Oh, okay. You're, you're, you're only going to miss like three slides, so you're good. Oh, see you, Tom. Bye, Tom. Nice to meet you guys. Bye. On the other hand, so you've got these. For the presentation. Oh, good. Thanks. <laughs> so you've got this, these trade offs. But on the other hand, when you focus on quality, obviously the benefit of focusing on quality is that you can improve the experiences of the children as they use these technologies. Um, and you can, you can sleep better at night, you know, because you feel like you're doing a good thing. But there are also two business advantages of focusing on quality. Um, one is that when you focus on quality, you do have additional opportunities of exposure through media sources and customer word of mouth. Um, our apps have received over 20 different awards and distinctions. Um, we get, frequently we get wonderful reviews, we have people emailing us, telling us that they love our apps, asking if, you know, if we can give them more promo codes for use in school and things like that. So, um, so that, those are, that's one of the benefits. And then the second benefit, business benefit of focusing on quality is that you can um, earn yourself some, some front page features. Five of our apps have been featured on the front page of the Apple App Store. Um, 
And we're not a big corporation with resources. We can't influence Apple's editorial decisions. And so the strategy that we can use, the thing that we can control is the quality of our apps. And so our hope is that when we produce high quality apps, that they will be noticed um, and that they will get featuring and that that way we can continue to make apps and run our business. Um, yeah, since we're, since we're a small company, I believe that our apps are featured because of their quality, not because of any influential power that we have. So I hope this presentation has provided some food for thought as you're developing your apps. And are there any questions or comments?